What this project is all about is it is taking a group of Unitech students uh, from a variety of different disciplines. Uh, so there are uh, nine students in total, and they're from a um, disciplines, uh, everything from architecture and landscape architecture through to operations, IT. And what we're doing is, um, for this first uh, iteration of the project, the generator is actually our client, and we are looking at a, um, from a service design perspective, uh, the model of the shared workspace. So we're looking at shared workspaces as they are currently in the world. We're also looking at the future of shared workspaces and that typology as a whole. And these guys have been tasked with having a look at that overall customer experience for the shared workspace environment and also to come up with some improvements and uh, suggestions for not only the generator as the client for this first iteration, um, but also uh, as a whole, and how, this, um, how their insights might be applied uh, both here and to uh, further expansions um, of this concept, uh, both nationally and internationally. So we're really excited about the project. It gives those students a really good opportunity not only to uh, work with a live client, which is Generator, but also to work within this space. So Unitech actually has a space upstairs. But they also get the opportunity to work with uh, other students from a range of different disciplines and thereby learn not only a little bit more around what those uh, students in the other disciplines do, but I guess it becomes a little bit closer to a real working environment where they get to experience um, the, the kind of decision making that needs to happen how you actually accommodate perhaps someone else's needs for the overall project, um, and generally a little bit more kind of real world learning. So without, um, without me carrying on too much, uh, I'd uh, like to extend a very um, warm welcome to Richard Burke. So I work for a company called Big Picture. We're a marketing insight and strategy company. We often call ourselves a marketing challenges company. Most of our clients come to us with a particular problem or a challenge. So it might be new product development, it might be advertising, it might be uh, branding, it might be you know, lots of different marketing challenges. So what I want to do tonight is talk you through our approach to that and hopefully give you some ideas about how design works in the world of marketing and also some tips on maybe the future of marketing or at least from a design perspective what could really be interesting in the next decade, even couple of years. I know tonight is kind of challenging in some ways because we've got students as well as business people so what I've tried to do is integrate both to uh, what I'm doing tonight. Great marketing by design. Would you say that has been well designed? What if we made the gradient look better? Put an uppercase letters and we put an exclamation mark on the end of it. Is that better? Is that better design? What if we change the colour? We get really excited. We use a different font. Is that better marketing? Is that, is that, is that better design? The point here, of course, is that you're probably appreciating that all of that was actually pretty bad. And that's because there hasn't been a connection. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight, is this idea of a customer connection, a client connection. Um, whether it's generator or whether it's another business, what I want to talk, do is talk about how you create that connection and what's important about it. Because then you've got marketing, then you've got design and marketing, which is important. It's not a trend. We talk a lot about customer connectedness. It's huge in every business, in every industry, in every occupation that relates to marketing. This is a key underlining thing. It's absolutely powerful. And whoever's doing it better than someone else will win the marketing battle. You know, it's part of everyday functioning. You know, it really is becoming a competitive sport. I don't know how many of you kind of subscribe to newsletters or whatever that has kind of marketing stuff in it. I'm littered with it. My inbox is just full of this stuff. So it's not about whether I can get something now. It's about choosing what it's going to be and actually working through this is of use and this isn't of use. It largely comes down to this relevancy piece. You know, is it, is it useful for me? Is it relevant to me? 
you know, so at the end of the day, it's a lot about um, this feeling of being left out um, and not wanting to be left out. And that's about the sort of customer connectedness. Tom Peters, we always go there to Tom Peters, always very useful. Does anyone know Tom Peters? Okay, so Tom Peters is probably the most prolific business writer in the world. He is writing everywhere. And a uh, very famous guy, he turns up to seminars and charges a horrendous amount of money, makes great speeches and away he goes. He's a clever guy, he's extremely clever. And he's clever because he does a good job of distilling ideas down. He takes complex things, complex elements, and he puts it all together. And he reckons business is about this. And if you think about it, it kind of is. So if you think about any business at all, whether it's supplier relationships, customer relationships, relationships within a business, and then it's about executing. We work with a host of Māori nationals, those both in New Zealand and other places in the world, and I would say that execution is one of the massive issues that most of them have. Lots of strategic planning, lots of workshops, Lots of stuff that we're going in and out all the time. Great for consultants like myself. You have a field day, you know. But do they actually execute well? Most of the time, not. Most of the time, an idea doesn't even get that far. And if it does, it's not executed to the extent that it should be. Where does connection miss the mark? Here are six things you want to look out for. Firstly, I mean, it's sort of 101, but it's so important and we forget it all the time. Who are you trying to connect with? Who is your market? Who is your customer? And we have a lot of businesses coming to us. They say, our customer is this, and they show us a demographic sheet, and they show us some behavioural kind of dimensions about who they are, etc. And then I say to them, but who are they? And I'll say, well, that, that, those are the numbers up there. And I'll say, yeah, but do you really understand who is going to buy that product? Who you are designing for? What turns them on? What excites them? How do they live their lives? Where do they live? Because all that stuff's often not done particularly well. This is classic in, in uh, professional services. Number two, squeezing as many features and benefits into marketing messages as possible. Happens all the time, you know. You'll have a, a marketing story and there'll be every benefit and every product trait going, you know, and it's, um, and it's not about it. It's about coming up with a coherent, simple story that plays well. Assuming that business-to-business -business marketing needs to be factual and informative. Do you think it is? So if you're selling to businesses, are you selling to rational decision makers? Is it not rational as in the cookie? But rational is, um, you know, they make decisions through logic. Clearly not. And it's even that kind of understanding. Acronyms, jargon, abbreviations, complex language, you know, you see it all the time. Every business publication that you'll ever come across has way too much of this stuff. Any marketing story, way too much. Pharmaceutical companies, really bad. Insurance companies, really bad. Banking companies, banking, banks, really bad, you know. They're getting better. I think there's a whole move in marketing towards chopping out all this stuff. And there's a greater discipline, I think, as marketing people start to realise that they, that ain't the future. It's a busy, cluttered world out there. So simplify your message, get down to the basic stuff. I think increasingly, are there any advertising agencies here? <laughs> I think increasingly, it's a hard sell in marketing. When you're looking at advertising and even marketing, you've got to be very genuine, I think, in what you're trying to sell and how you're selling it. I think the days of big glossy ads that look good but don't have a lot of substance to them, I think they've gone. And I think you've really got to work your story back. And you can't just create a story. I think those days have gone as well. I think you've actually got to be very genuine in what you're doing. Particularly if you're a small company and want to get bigger. There has to be a truth an insight that that business is founded on, which is powerful, and then design from that truth. And as designers, you really want to go out there and you want to find that truth, because that will be the base, that will be the centre point of what their whole business is about. Lack of consistency, it sounds really boring, 
but when you're dealing with creative people particularly, it's something that needs to happen or, be, or they need to be reminded all the time. Great to have a new idea. Great to have a new logo. Great to refresh this, do this, do this. You need to keep moving. You need to be modern. But you also need to work out what's the stuff that you need to be, you need to have continuity about that you don't want to change. That's why logo changes. What do you think of the, what do you think of the new telecom logo? Thoughts? It's not that new now. Did you even notice it? This is the asterisk. This is the asterisk. Good, Betty. Neither to update. A lot of angst went into that. A lot of angst went into that. A lot of meetings, a lot of decisions. You know, there was this and uh, you know, there was a lot going on with it. It was the right decision, but you wouldn't have thought that something as simple as that would have been so complex to actually execute. But it was, because everyone's got an opinion on the board there. So part of getting these strings through, of course, is ensuring that you have everyone aligned and actually going down the same line. So it's not actually just coming up with the idea, it's ensuring that the stakeholders actually believe in what you're trying to give them. So where does design come into marketing? Really easy answer. Everywhere. Look at the most successful brands in the world and tell me that they haven't, they haven't got good designers on them. Because they have whether it's from a marketing perspective, perspective or a product modeling perspective or indeed a brand perspective overall, it's huge. Good design is a good brand. You can't have a good brand without good design. And I think it's really important for New Zealand. Um, at Big Picture, we're massive advocates of New Zealand brands. In fact, we, we have a good number. They're either owned in New Zealand or they're positioned as New Zealand brands in most categories. It's a couple we'd like, <laughs> but we've got a good, a good number of them. We're passionate about this. We're passionate about New Zealand and we're passionate about New Zealand branding. And this is something that we do well. We've got good designers here and we need to take it to the world a bit more often than we are at the moment. You look at almost every touch point in a pretty typical service business. Lady, sponsorship, newsletters, website, reception, PR releases, the bill, you know, it's all design. It's all design. And that is a brand. All this stuff is brand. Every touch point here is your brand. People often talk about brands as ads. They're not. A brand is everything from the people that work in the business to, to the cars that they drive to the way they dress. To, you know, that, that is brand. Brand is everything that, has, that makes sense or uh, is perceived by someone else about a particular idea. Here's a model that we work with. I'll just chuck these in as we're going along because it, it's kind of interesting what some of the uh, big guys are doing and how they use these different models. This is a touch points model and it basically looks at different variables. So we go out there and we work out what are the key variables that make up a business. That define a business. So it could be the building. Generator, I'd say it's probably the building, it's probably a key touch point here. Um, for a lot of other businesses, they may not even see the building, so it's probably not important at all. You know, what, what do your peer group think? What do people in your industry think? What do people, if it's a beverage for instance, what are the other you know, people in that market thinking about the product? Accounts, pricing, advertising, you know, these are all touch points and they all need to be designed up in some way. So, what have we established? We've established that design is critical to market, and you can bring a lot of insight work to marketing which makes it better. How important is this thing called a brand? And is it important in service markets? Believe it or not, this used to be a discussion point. It's not that many years ago. How important is brand in service industries? Trying to market a service business using a big brand. Well, the jury's out, and the answer is, of course, it is. But it needs to be dealt with differently. This is interesting. These are from professional service um, people, you know, DDB at the top one. The service of their 100% of tangible, they must sell a brand in marketing, such other processes, business development, and all the 
what he's basically saying is that brand is everything. You know, you need brand is the calling card. You don't get the call unless you've got a good brand. And then once you've got a good brand, then you can make the sale. But unless you're in the consideration seat, you're not going to be you're not going to be cool. And what do I mean by brand? They've got the same brand as everything. Really. It's all these key touch points. All right. So brands have developed an offer which is repeatable and trainable. That's why these guys that set up franchise businesses selling services like insurance brokers or whatever. You know, they've done, they've done a good job. It's not that easy to get that right. A lot of it's about process within the organisation, which is probably hard in um, FMCG or something similar. How important is designer with the biggest brands? What brand is this one? We had one response there in the front here. Apple. Yeah, cool. You're not helping here, I'm just trying to demonstrate something. <laughs> Which is even it's just a simple colour, like that Apple owns this now, you know, that's amazing. It's incredible that a brand can own that. It's just a bloody white page. They own the colour white. That is phenomenal. Who's this? I am. Yeah, too much. <laughs> Who's this? Apple. Google. 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 Who's this? <laughs> and you recognise them because they're power brands. They're very successful brands. This is fascinating. So here's a brand. Apple is the number one brand in the world based on value, one hundred eighty-two million dollars. You say, well, that's not much. The business is worth billions, isn't it? Well, it is. But that figure is just for the brand, not the business. That's just if you take Apple and put it on something, that's what they think you're going to get in repeat sales, 182 million. So that's just the logo. So if you're really clever, maybe you just whip out a logo, a new name, and it could be something. You know? Anyway, point being, lots, lots of money. And this is just for the mark. Just for the brand, yeah. Interesting, the top ten brands and uh, who's coming up the list, who's dropping and who's uh, getting stronger. I'm surprised that Microsoft actually is uh, still up there as the stick of data. There's a brand, I mean, not, not the business, just the brand. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Have, uh, have you guys seen this? Courtesy of Kevin Roth, such and such. We use it a bit. It's interesting because what it's saying is that you can have love for a brand, you can have likability for a brand, but it doesn't mean you actually respect the brand. Therefore, it's probably not a great brand. You can have a brand that you respect, but you may not like it. Does it make it a great brand? It makes it an okay brand. If you've got both things working for you, you're away in racing. And that is a power brand high love and high respect. All of the brands in that top 10 are power brands that have both respect and love. Maybe not by everyone, but by some people. You can do it by categories as well. You know, if you look at banking, there might be a category that you respect, but you may not love. And for all those Kawasaki riding people, you know, that might be, yeah, might be a brand you love, but most people don't. They respect it, they think they're a good job, but they don't necessarily love it. Real estate interesting, you know, so low love, low respect. So they've got a they've got a typical job on their hands, you know. And then you've got fans, high love, low respect. Do you remember these? Yeah. They came and they went. They're normal to study the flat. They have Yeah, they study for a fair. You still got some at home. I'm proud you wish study. See that the way you come here? I'm not so sure you'll see. So this is not where you want to be. Could they have turned some of this? I mean, I think MySpace is really interesting, you know. I mean, what the hell happened to MySpace? They were in such a good position, you know. They could have done so much more than they did. Tamagotchi, I'm not so sure about. And now they're coming back, aren't they? Now they're coming back. Tamagotchi, come on, come on, come on. MySpace is coming back. Oh, yeah. So they get going in brand situations. Yeah, I don't know if they'll even come back to where they were. Yeah, interesting. I want to 
positioning. Okay, so the, so the next question is that you've got a brand and manual position. Do we know what positioning is? Positioning is about where we, where we take a particular place in the market and plonk our brand down there and then we want to own that part of the market. It needs to stand for something. Does that make sense? And it's harder now to be different. It's really tough. Like I, it's interesting, I just before I got here, I had a walk around this precinct, and they've been here for probably a while. I was saying, we've got, we had Westpac Supply, um, and we used to visit here quite a bit. But it's just interesting looking at the bars that have come set up, and the similarity a lot in terms of how they've even set themselves out, and what they're selling, and their product, and all the rest of it. And it just said to me once again, it's really hard to be different. Particularly in New Zealand, we're a small country, so when a good idea kind of comes out, everyone runs over it, you know, and it's just, and it happens so fast. It's a little bit different to places like the States or Europe where you can, you can have a, a market, you can have a product which has a little niche, but it's an extremely profitable niche because their niche is our market. You know, we have, we've got uh, a lot of people from overseas that we can take picture, uh, both in the UK and the US. And they're always amazed at how good we are at lots of things. You know, best in class over here in the world, particularly when it comes to marketing. You know, really good people that are doing so much. But they're saying, but you kind of have to be. It's very hard to have a singular position in here around one particular product. You almost have to have a bigger footprint because the market's so small. The other thing too, particularly with service businesses, there's a real reluctance to say, we don't actually do that. And I think it's because of that idea. It's very hard to stick to that discipline. We are positioned on this, to have that integrity around your offer and say, actually, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do that, we don't do that. Really hard, you know, when you've got to pay the bills. If someone's came out with a team, come on, you're a business team, sorry, we don't do that. Real challenge for us. This is a great quote, and it's so true, isn't it? If you've only got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And it is so right, you know. So if you're in a particular business, then every problem that you come across happens to relate to your business in some way, you know. And this also makes kind of coming up a difference, a point of difference, difficult. So, for all your businesses here, what makes you different? What's the one thing that makes you unique? I won't spend too much time on this, but this basically comes back to the steam of there's all the stuff that's going on around deeper needs. And partly it's about understanding what those needs are. So, if you're designing something, if, you design, if, you're, if you're helping with the design around a business, then what are the sort of questions you should be asking yourself? Is what you're designing all about choice and innovation? Is that what the business is about? Or is it more about status and leadership? Or is it about expertise and competency? Because they're all delivering quite different needs. Or is it about trust and reassurance? Or is it about a business that offers collaboration in partnership? Or is this business a choice about freshness and energy? This is Mavbrand, a proprietary product with a picture. Um, it is probably the most successful marketing model in the world. This is our version of it. So, probably the most successful marketing model in the world. And it came out of little old New Zealand. The most well known one is called Nisco. And it has been exported in many, many markets and in many, many businesses around the world. There'd be very few big multinational businesses that don't have this model or some version of it. And it came out of a, a guy's here, Paul Hayden, who basically took two schools of thought and psychology and brought them together. It's extremely powerful. It's a two-dimensional model, extroverted, introverted, affiliated, and individual. And what it does, it lays out territories, it lays out needs. I don't get too kind of involved, but it's basically young and fraud. We are getting there, but now. 
So if you think about energy, high energy, low energy, and then you think about affiliation or individuality, and you think about all of us want to express that in some way, then that is how this model works, and then you can have needs around it that are then catered or structured for a particular market. Just an example of where some of the brands kind of fit. So you would put Apple Innovation. Mercedes, obviously, Steve, IBM, and Proficiency, et cetera, Toyota, and Collaboration. So one of the decisions to be made when you're looking at a brand is, well, what need of your customer are you trying to meet with your business? Good questions, these. What does a needs-based positioning look like? First thing is functionally. What is the business offering you? Socially, what do you want to look like? Emotionally, what are you actually trying to key into and emotionally? So I'll give you some examples. McKinsey, does anyone know McKinsey? Special services business. Um, probably one of the leading uh, business consultancy businesses in the world. This is their vision, I suppose, their kind of statement on intent around what, who they are as a business and what they do. Kind of interesting. But when you go through this, it gives you a clear understanding as to where they are positioned. So if you go back to NAV for a minute, and you think about that model, when one is about affiliation, one end, and the other one is about individuality, where do you think they as a business would sit? So they're trying to be collaborative, and, you know, work in teams, and all that kind of stuff, or is it more about who are working with Kinsey? and we select some of the brightest, smartest people in the world. Yeah, that's right. So you can do this across all sorts of businesses, all sorts of professional services businesses. But yeah, McKinsey certainly sits right inside. The question would be, and, and I imagine they would probably have this debate internally, do they sit up here? Because they have in the past, I don't know where they sit at the moment, or do they sit down here? So they, they're trying to rebirth the business, refresh the business around innovation and kind of doing things differently. Or are they more about efficiency? And you buy McKinsey, you buy absolute reassurance that you're going to get it right. Kind of interesting. Going to run you through a banking category now. You can see it's a little dated because one of those brands doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> So you've got a you've got a good brand. This must have been a hell of a big business. Same with Countdown and uh, and and Woolworths, you know. So you've got National Bank, which is probably the premium preeminent brand in banking in New Zealand, all by itself. Then you've got ANZ, which is a little, a little bit more cluttered over in this space here. And what do you do? You give it a national bank. And, uh, bring in, uh, and then rebrand A and Z. They are working pretty hard, from what I can understand, to move this way. They're trying to premiumize the National Bank, sorry, A and Z, to ensure that they don't lose the National Bank customers. And that's their big task. I think they've done it relatively successfully. So I'm just trying to give you an insight into how this model of their brand is actually pretty effective. From a design perspective, you know, if you were, if you were designing workplaces, how would that work around these different needs? Because this, this, this looks at colour, it looks at everything, it looks at the kind of organisation you're running, you know? I think that one might be a little bit ambitious. Who knows? But you can kind of see where different workspaces or different styles, how does this work with a generator? Where would you say the generators is? So we're on left hand or right hand? The side, left hand side? Right hand. Left, right, left, right. I think it's fair to say that we would be higher, because you've got to remember this would be in the context of other businesses like the generator. Yeah, so right hand side. Yeah. So some would be more like this. I know there's a couple 
the same thing. I think the same shapes are around the same, but mm. the stripes are around the same. And it probably, so the first question would be what market are we in? This is one. Yeah. It's a good question, it's a great discipline around. You know, how do you work out what category you want, market you're in, who you are? Alright, I feel like I'm whizzing through this pretty quickly, but, uh, so bear with me and feel free to ask questions. Uh, I thought it would be interesting just to tag on some thoughts around what are some of the trends happening out there right now. Because we were out there working with uh, customers and consumers day to day, and you picked up a few tips on. You know what's hot and what's not, and and I thought this might be interesting from a design perspective. Look, there's someone down the stairs who's also going through a presentation. I'm sure that they've uh, uh, got some of that work in mind to do. It's um, you know, we're talking passion about New Zealand, so we're inherently biased, but we also know too that it's absolutely on trend. And the question would be, but hasn't it always been? Or was, you know, 10 years ago, New Zealand was cool. And it's kind of like, well, it is. But the trick is, of course, is providing the right version. Where do we sit as a country? We sit here. This is great space to be in, you know, vitality. It's great space to design in. So New Zealand is, is a culture, as a country. We've done, we've done their brand across the world. So you can actually plot countries and cultures. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see where people sit. It's interesting like, where the other brands sit too, you know. We also think too that um, that whole New Zealand story piece is You've got to have a unique expression on them. Those brands that have done that well, um, they really have a good story to tell. And it's a story which is exportable. You know? And the story is always, at some level, comes around about, comes down to sort of distance and dependence and the unconventional. And if you look at those brands, they've all kind of had an element of that. Zero is probably more about unconventional, so I don't know whether they tell a unique and using the story. Style like reinvented really here. All with the design of the whole, pretty much. Is, is, zero, uh, is everyone pleased with the work that Zero has been doing? Do you go to Zero? Do you say? Zero. Sorry, Z. Z. <laughs> no. You're not pleased? I'm not pleased. It's a, too much of a commodity to get. Do you think it means it's too commoditized? That's what I mean, two dots can be dots can be everywhere. Yeah. So if you think they're not really selling petrol and they're selling everything else, and they're doing a good job with that when you actually walk in there and you look at all the products they're selling and the other sort of experience. And I look at what they're doing, and I look at what their opposition did, which is BP, which is the number one brand in the market. And it's interesting to see what they're doing right now. Have you seen it? Have you all done They're doing their whole Kiwi out of that, big time. So as soon as these guys were bought by, who were they bought by? The New Zealand, what's that? Infotool. And they New Zealandified it. They became the Kiwi out of story. And they've done pretty well when you walked in the gym. It looked pretty good, you know. I've got to say, they're giving us a run around money, I think. Supporting the Z3. Well, I reckon the other tip too is this idea of heading for the middle ground. They call it democratisation of luxury or accessible premium. There's lots of terminology around it. And essentially it comes back to wanting more and paying less. And the brands that are nailing that. Whether it's Jeeps Coffee or something else, I'm just talking about FMCG at the moment, but businesses and uh, services are exactly the same, are doing really well. So that is a special place at the moment. 
the weather will be the case in a few years' time, not too sure, but right now, if you're starting businesses up or you're looking at growing business, that is where you want to be. Democratisation of premium. Big to small. There's something, there's something pretty exciting about this, and it's like an overall theme, or almost a motif in some ways. But if you take something big and you make it smaller in all sorts of ways conceptually, then there's probably a greater margin. And you can apply that principle in lots of different ways. You know, the generator is essentially going to say the big space, but the smaller space is going to solve that. Master personal, you know, broker businesses everywhere. You know, it's taking a mass product and personalising it, customising it. Manufactured the handmade. Interesting how single serve products are coming in big time. And they're selling them to families. Why? Because they just have a lot more convenient to work with often. So they get five single serves or five you know, individual serves rather than a big family pack. So interesting. Property, huge, you know. Lots of property divided with small. So the overall theme is there. And I think whoever takes that principle and applies it well in businesses will do well out of it. The store within a store, we've seen that happen a lot. In fact, it was one of the reasons why farmers um, has really been through a rebirth and is, and is trading so well now. They said, actually, we need an experience within an experience. How do we apply it? Right, almost there. So the last little bit. It's probably, uh, I was going to say, it's the most interesting thing. Creativity is an amazing thing. It is the magic that makes brands and marketing work. And the more creativity you have, it's applied in a commercial way, the more powerful the brand experience. But there is a little problem that we come up against. Particularly if um, you're kind of at the experience end of the spectrum, which is getting closer to the consumer and the customer. And it is this. You can't research creativity. Creativity is special and they won't understand it. We refute that. We believe that co-creating is an incredibly powerful process. No one has a license on it. In fact, one of the uh, one of the aspects of branding which is naming, I think is incredibly fun, you know. Because you can get a name from anywhere at all, whether it's the person in a dairy around the corner or whether it's the attendant that put feet on your car, you know. You have thought of a name for whatever the business might be, you know. It's also one of those challenging aspects of uh, starting a business, I think, often sometimes. Because everyone has an opinion on it. But that's my point. Everyone does have an opinion on it, so why not harness that and make it a collaborative process? We're big on create, tune up, Create, tune up, create, tune up. So basically continuing to consult with the customer and then retuning and then go again and then go again. So you do a little bit of research and then you work on what you can work and then you go back and do a little bit more. Which is believe it or not, it's actually an unusual approach. If you go to a lot of a marketing strategy, sort of research most of the time you do a project. Project comes and goes, and a lot of corporates are really big on that. Let's do the project. We believe it's much better to do little bits. You're coming in there of the market and checking and you know, having a look at what you're doing. But there is a but, and the but is really important. The but is about who you're consulting with at a market level. Talk to early adopters. Talk to people who are creative thinkers in their own in their, in their own way, in their own market. Talk to people who are happy to look at what the future could be like. Because they're the people that are doing two things. They're representative of your market and they're, and, and they're also creatively interested and inspiring and you can use those things. Two truths. You need to ask your client, I reckon, about uh, how you're going, whether it's what, whether what you're delivering is what they're all wanting. And in detail, like big kind of uh, 
aggressively in how it's built and stuff to get it. Because you want feedback, you want criticism about what's working, not working. And if you hear the word fine, watch out, because that is the kiss of death. Someone comes in and says, you know, the word is fine, that ain't good. So, in summary, four points. Needs, to understand what the need is of the market that you're trying to work with, what is the big insight that drives your business forward. And if you can't say that to someone in one sentence, then that's a problem, and you probably need to work on or hone on it, language it up. A lot of people say, is it important? We, we actually believe it's really It's the lifeblood of your business. Brand, acknowledge and understand the importance of brand and design within the Brand is everything. Work out your brand story, how design fits in the world. A powerful story will give you scale, and it takes you from a novelty to a power brand situation. I reckon a lot of businesses can sell a particular product or service for a short amount of time and do okay. It may not be a majority of business, but there's not that many businesses that can scale and actually get sold. That's really where you've got to start listening to your customers, start listening to your market, and start interpreting what they want. And then collaborate. You don't have to do it by yourself. Go back to that customer. Go back to the consumer. And um, you know, and say, look, we've got this wrong. Yeah, go for the design production. So what I wanted to do now was see whether there are any thoughts on what I've been through. Because some of it probably is uh, quite full on. You see, some of the models that we work with. Is there anything that you thought was interesting that you can pick up and kind of apply to what you guys do? Understand that you're kind of doing different things. I've got a question about why you put New Zealand in the vitality spot, given that we're pretty much known internationally for our laid back Purity sits up there, and purity is about vitality. So our laconic, laid-back, Kiwi kind of attitude, it's more an internal relief. But when you're looking at brands that succeed overseas, the stuff that most of you are pushing, and tourism in New Zealand is a big role to play in that, is around purity. And there's no reason I'm going to a, uh, a conference on Monday, which is following up that whole thing around, you know, when they have the... Um, uh, John Fee and Bruce Gill that gone to China. You know, that is essentially what it's about. How do we, how do we brand and export New Zealand this and also food and beverage companies around that to the likes of those markets? And I think that purity piece is absolutely what we're known for. The problem with that is we, we, uh, we have this challenge quite a bit, or hear this question quite a bit. The problem with it is it's hard to provide personality at a communication level to purity. Purity by definition is quite passive and quite stilted. Um, so giving that a sense of life and energy is actually quite difficult. So that's kind of a challenge for brands that choose to use that positioning. It's powerful positioning, that's a great place to be. We're very fortunate and we've got it. And largely it's about our landscape and our environment. We're a long way away. Good. Good. Well done. Thank you. Thank you kindly, sir. Um, so, just to, um, just to uh, cap off, uh, first of all, just a round of applause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you kindly, sir. Um, so, next, uh, next week we will have uh, Russell Douglas who is the head of uh, Interactive at DesignWorks. And uh, Russell will be talking around um, the use of interactive and the use of digital um, in enhancing the customer experience and contributing to the customer experience. Um, doing some very interesting work at the moment. Um, so that'll be quite an, uh, a good session, I'd imagine. Um, 
On Tuesday, the 7th of May, we have Nat uh, Cheshire of uh, Cheshire Architects, who will talk around um, uh, this building as well as the wider Britomart uh, precinct. And the next session after that, for which we don't have a date yet, will be Andy Hamilton from the Ice House, um, who will be looking at the similarities and uh, differences uh, between the Ice House as an incubator model um, and the shared space typology um, and interrogating some of that. So I hope to see you at some of those events. Um, as I said previously, I mentioned drinks on, on a number of occasions. <laughs> you, you're welcome to, um, to hang around for a drink uh, should you wish, have a bit of a conversation. Otherwise, uh, we hope to see you next Tuesday. Thanks again for um, making the time available to uh, come along this evening, and thanks again to, uh, to Richard for his wonderful <laughs>